Hey, good morning, City Church. Good to be here, isn't it? Let me just, let me, I'm just like lay some advance notice on you today. God showed up early today in a good way. Before service, first service, praising God. I thank you, worship team, for leading us in worship, inviting us. And it's God's idea, by the way, to meet with his people, to receive our worship, and to move among us. So it's been a great day, and uh, we're praying for a continued presence and movement of God's Spirit among His people uh, as we're gathered together today. So, uh, Mr. Irrelevant. Anybody hear that term? Know what that is? I don't realize, I'm not a, like a sports fanatic per se, but it wasn't until last year, a year ago, that uh, I heard about the term Mr. Irrelevant. Mr. Irrelevant turns out in the National Football League, Pro pro Football, every year, you know, they have a draft, right? And so the teams go in order and they pick the people they want. And so after several rounds and hundreds hundreds of uh, players being drafted from college, eventually, you know, they get to the end of it. And so at the very end of the draft, the very last person turns out, the very last person chosen in the draft historically is, is called Mr. Irrelevant. I mean, like, come on, you, you got to hope your mama and your grandma love you because that's not really a self-esteem builder, right? But the idea is like, hey, someone's got to choose. We got to get this thing over with. So, you know, all the people that everybody already really wanted has been chosen, but we got to have one more choice. So the last person, and you know, for the most part, people feel like, well, the last guy chosen probably not going to make it on a team and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's Mr. Irrelevant. So, however, in 2022, I guess the draft was, Mr. Irrelevant, the last person chosen, was a young man who was a quarterback at Iowa State University by the name of Brock Purdy. And no one knew about Brock Purdy. No one, I guess, unless, again, you were a hardcore, even realized that he made the roster of some team. But in one day... In one day, Mr. Irrelevant became the starting quarterback. It was in one game, not just the starting quarterback, but the second quarterback went down. First guy went down, second guy goes down, and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, we need a quarterback. Wait, who's supposed to, who, who is that guy? Oh, yeah, 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 some dude named Purdy. We don't even know if the coach knew him, you know, like, hey, bro, go in. So all of a sudden, Mr. Irrelevant. The very last guy chosen is starting for the San Francisco 49ers. And here's the cool thing. You don't really have to be a fan of sports to appreciate this. And he led his team to the NFC Championship game. Mr. Irrelevant to a hero. Now, we've been talking about David, King David. And as I thought about it, I realized, you know what? David is the biblical version of Mr. Irrelevant, right? That we, we, no one even knew about David. He was, he was a forgotten shepherd boy. When Samuel went and, and, and called for, for all the sons because God was going to do something great, they didn't even think about asking him to show up to the meeting. He was Mr. Irrelevant, but God took that forgotten shepherd boy and he became a king. And not only that, the pathway to the eternal king. You see, David, the unlikely choice, was used by God to firmly establish Israel as a nation and God's people to show us God's desire for authentic a relationship with humanity, individually and corporately, and clearly and decisively establish the ultimate plan, God's ultimate plan for humanity. Because it is in and through David that the king and the kingdom that he represented far exceeded his earthly time and rule. And that's what I want to focus on this morning forgotten shepherd boy to the eternal king of kings. Let's pray before we continue on. God, thank you for the joy and privilege of 
being together in worship corporately. God, thank you that we have the freedom to uh, gather here today to express, God, our worship in, in song and word, and also, God, in prayer, in fellowship. We pray, God, that as we uh, study and, and think about, God, this, this character, David, King David, as, as many of us have been studying over the weeks and months, uh, his life, God, that you would help us to see what it is that you were doing, how, why God is important, what it, how it is, God, that you want us to grow, what you want us to know about David, about ourselves, and about you. We pray it in Jesus' name <clears throat> this, this morning. Amen. So today is sort of, the, sort of, we've been in a series called The Life and Leadership of David, King David, David in the Bible. And, and so the, the summary, is this is kind of the summary. And so the more I thought about it, I, I got to tell you, a, a few weeks ago, I just started like making a list, right? So uh, pretty much every morning I go to the, this isn't a, you know, plug or ad, advertisement, but I go to the Panera near my house and uh, I'd sit there. And then, so I pull out and I'm just making a list of all things. Well, like if you were going to summarize David, what would you say? On and on and on. And then I realized that as we, that we've learned lots of great things about David, but when you really bring it down, or in this case, expand it out to what we've learned, I believe that this is uh, God's word for us in learning from David uh, over these last months. So uh, one of the things we do to participate, if you, if you uh, would like to, when you came in, you've got a worship folder. There's a little fill-in-the-blank deal there you can use to uh, participate. It helps to participate, write notes, thoughts, um, as we move along. So several things I'm suggesting um, as we think about what, we have, what we've learned, what are the main things we could pull out of this sort of long uh, study of David, as it were. And here's the first point in the first uh, fill in the blank there. God's concern is your inner self. God's concern about you in the inner you. Now, the first time we see David, as I already mentioned, if you know the story, the first time we see David, he is Mr. Irrelevant. No one even thought to invite him, but God through this prophet Samuel said, wait, is there, is there no one else? So yeah, well, there's Mr. Irrelevant, right? So they call David the forgotten shepherd boy and he comes. And this is where we get the first powerful uh, uh, idea, statement, concept of what's important to God. And it follows through as we study David and actually all of humanity. And it's, it's found in 1 Samuel 16 when God says to them, uh, to Samuel and, and the people, um, don't consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. He's talking about all the, the other people. The Lord does not look at people, uh, things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance. The Lord looks at the heart. And so one of the very first things we see about this person, David, that we never even heard about before is that there's something different. That God is saying, look, you're looking at the strong, the smart, the accomplished, the educated, the religious, whatever it is. You're looking at all those things and thinking that's what's really important. But I'm telling you that what I'm really concerned about is the internal, the inside, the inner you. David was described as uh, having, uh, who was a person after God's own heart. And, and again, I realize not everybody, we haven't been together in this, this same group for the whole series, but if you know anything about David, you know that there were ups and downs, ups and downs. But the thing that, the thread that remained through is that David had a passion for God. He believed in God. If you were to characterize him, you'd have to say that he, he believed and lived out the, the commitment that God was in charge and God would take care of things. If God said something, God would take care of it. He had a passion to worship God. He, he believed that, that, there were, that expressing himself, he was a poet musician as well as a political ruler and king. And so he obeyed God. He was faithful. God blessed him even with the ups and the downs. And so, the, but the point there was that internally, that's what God pulled out and held up as the primary now that sets up the ongoing struggle, doesn't it? For all, for any of us, let's just, well, I'm looking out here, maybe there aren't too many religious people here, but the, the ongoing struggle between the external and the internal, especially when it comes to things like religion, 
right? And this was an ongoing struggle in the scriptures and in our lives. And we figure like, well, if I do the right things, I keep the rules, I do this, I don't do that, I show up, I do all these things that are external behaviors. That's what, that's what God wants. That's it. That's the main and primary thing. Now, I'm not saying that our external behavior is not important, but what happens is we think that if we just look it, then that's what's really going on. And God's saying, you know, no, actually, I'm not so much concerned about what you can put on. I'm concerned about the inner you. And so there was this continuous struggle. And oftentimes we look at the Older Testament and we all the, the, uh, um, the, the complex system of, of uh, sacrifices and holy days and holidays and all that kind of stuff. And they became very concerned to keep all the rules, keep all the rules, do all the religious-looking external stuff. And God was continually trying to tell his people that you're, you're missing it, you're missing it. And finally, uh, through the prophet Hosea, Many, many times, but in the prophet Hosea, uh, you'll find this little tiny prophet Hosea, chapter 6, verse 6. This is what God says to the people. I don't want your sacrifices. I want your love. I don't want your offerings. I want you to know me. And so what we see that what, what God is concerned about with humanity and with us is that God wants us to, the inner us, to be connected to God. Of course, the, probably the best example of this, if you fast forward you know, to Jesus, uh, and Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, the famous Sermon on the Mount, and a very uh, in- incredible teaching of Jesus. But there's a whole section in there where Jesus starts out, and he says a whole bunch of things, and it starts out like this. You have heard it said, blah, 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 fill in the blank, but I say to you, are you, you know what I'm saying? For instance, he said, he, he would say something like, you have heard it said, uh, do not commit adultery. But I say to you, if you lust, that's committing adultery. What Jesus was saying is externally, you cannot commit the act, but if internally you're not there, that's what God is concerned about. You see, so Jesus brings it like radically out to people who would say, if I just, if I just externally toe the line, but God is concerned with the inner self. Now, God's ultimate solution, and this is great. I love this. Uh, there are a couple of different verses that have just I have loved over so many years. I, I call it God's ultimate solution about the inner me problem, and that God promised through the prophets, as recorded in Ezekiel 26, also Jeremiah chapter 31, and, and other places. But in this case, God says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove that heart of stone, that dead heart. God's promise, well, that, that, was, that was God's solution. There's going to come a day and a time when you'll have, when, I, when I'll give you a real heart and I'll be able to, and I will put my word inside your heart and your mind and I will literally, my spirit will be in your spirit. That was the promise. And, and that was the, I call it the ultimate solution. That's how we would get to uh, that not being stuck in the external, but living in God's concern for the internal. The second fill in it, uh, really is very, very close to this. And that is this, that God desires and invites worship that is personal, honest, and intimate. The thing that we, one of the things that we saw about David is that he was an amazing worshiper. Yes, he was a warrior. He was a, he was a very prolific and successful warrior and politician and king and all, and all those things. And God used all that. But amazingly, the thing that, that really connected him to God was his, his desire and commitment to connect with God, the inner connection to God, and to be very honest and personal about it. Uh, the 103rd Psalm for instance, says, praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being praise his holy name. And when you look at particularly in the Psalms and other, I, I would call them worship literature in the scripture, you'll see that, that the, the worship that God desires is not the external, right? That's what God said through Hosea. I'm not really interested in you going through all emotions. What I desire is that you know me. 
And so um, that was what David uh, opened up for us. Now, a few, uh, it was the first Sunday of October, if you were, if you were here, Pastor Obi uh, did a, a fantastic teaching on worship, uh, as, as we learn from David, King David, the worshiper, the worship leader. And he shared with us uh, seven words, which are concepts, which are be- behaviors and, and worship act- activities and actions and responses. And uh, just fantastic. If you weren't here for that, I would just invite you and strongly encourage to find it in the sermon archives off the website or YouTube or whatever it is. I don't know, it's somewhere out there. But someone who's younger than you will help you find it. That's how I live my life. Uh, but uh, check that out because, because he did just a, a fantastic job reminding us that, that God uh, desires and actually expects his people because he's concerned about your heart, your spirit, and your mind, and your soul. And there are times that we read in the Psalms where David was just pretty ticked off. He was just sick and tired of life. He was sick and tired of people. He was sick and tired of bad people. Sometimes he was sick and tired of good people. And what, what is amazing about the honesty of that and the person, personality of that, or the personal nature of that, is that David would just say it. God, why is it that my enemies, they always seem like they're winning, they're winning. And, and he would, you know, I'm sick and tired of people and, and why don't you take care of them? But here's the amazing thing about the heart of David is that he would express it. And I've, I've said, try to say to myself and I've said to people for years, if you're really ticked off and upset and you want to tell God about it, I think God can handle it. Why not? Why wouldn't God want you to be honest? Get it out. And then open yourself up to what God would say. And that's what we often see in David. He would get it out and then he would come around and say, you know, but God, my experience is that you're actually in control. That you are a strong tower. That you are a fortress. That you are a good shepherd. And so what we see about worship, the the inner self and the worship that God desires and welcomes us to be worshipers that are honest and personal and connected to God. The third point is this that we see in the overall uh, uh, picture and narrative of David in the life uh, is that God's purposes can survive my hum- human lapses. Now, I'm sharing with the first service. I, I, I use the word lapses because, I don't know, it's a, it sounded cooler than failures, screw-ups, losers, but the fact is that when we watch David, we see that, that for all of his desire and his sincere heart to, to be close to God and do what God wanted him to do, oftentimes he, he had lapses. He failed. He, he, he didn't meet the goal. He fell far short. And I would say, man, we ought to be glad for that. We ought to be glad that Scripture doesn't sugarcoat David. Because humanity is, is tough. Living life is a struggle sometimes. And, and we are not always successful. And sometimes we fail. We may have good intentions, but we don't quite make it. We may try hard, but we fail. We may not try hard and we fail. But what we, saw, what we see in David and what we see then, which is true of all of us in humanity, that God's purposes can have do and will survive my human lapses, my failures, my shortcomings. And and it was incredible to watch how it was that God continued to work through David, even through those lapses. One of the uh, great reminders of that from Isaiah, I think this is in your resource list that may be on the bottom of your worship folder there, is that that, uh, God in Isaiah 55 says, look, my plans are not your plans. My ways are not your ways. I am, I am a comp- going about accomplishing my purposes in the world. And here's the great news. When we fall a little bit short of fully being on board with God's plan, when we, when we lapse, we fail, we go off track, we forget, we get lazy, whatever it is, here's the good news. We don't get voted off the island. God says, yeah, that's the way human beings are. Hey, come back. Just, just get, get back. Get back. You're welcome back. God's purposes can handle human lapses. 
So then we can say what a fantastic verse from uh, the New Testament, the Apostle Paul saying, look, God is working. God is actually working all things for the good of those who love him and call it according to his purpose. You see, his purpose is the point. His purpose is what's going on. His purpose is what God is doing. And God is working things. We don't always get to see that, right? It's far, far, far above my pay grade to look down and question the sovereignty and God. But what I know is that God does know. And the scriptures promise us that God is working with us, sometimes in spite of us, but working these things because there's a purpose in my life, in your life, a purpose in the world that God is accomplishing. There is a purpose in the world that God was accomplishing in the life of David. And lapses, lapses don't keep that from happening. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church, as recorded in Philippians, that he who began a good work in you will continue it and carry it on. What a great promise. See, the purposes of God God's going to carry that on in, your, in our lives, in our lives. We saw it in David. We can see it in our own lives. We can see it in the lives of those who choose to follow Jesus. One of the worship lyrics in the songs uh, where it's, I think we sing after, after the teaching here, uh, the, it is, I sought the Lord, he heard, he answered. I sought the Lord, he heard, he answered. So you see, what we learn, what we need to grasp onto is that God's purpose is God's purposes continue in spite of human lapses. Now, from here on, the last couple points, I, 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 just, want, I just want you to know that, that we're going to go way wide and way narrow all at the same time. Now, let me explain what I mean. Because the next point is this. God keeps his promises. This is what we learn from the life of David. God keeps his promises. Now, God keeps his promises that, that we understand and see. For instance... Samuel came and he anointed David, the you know, forgotten uh, shepherd boy, Mr. Irrelevant, and said, you're going to be the king. Did he become the king? Not for a long time. Why? Because as our pastor reminded us, there was this guy named Crazy Uncle Saul. But God kept his promise and David believed in that. And so God said, you're going to be king. And he was, he kept his promise. The things that God said would happen happen because God keeps his promises. Now it starts with David as the king of a nation. And then and and so we see that God chose David. He promised him to be the king, but then he started making promises to David that you, you, you gotta just stop and and listen for a moment to what God was saying to David, the earthly king. So for instance in 2 Samuel 7, this is called the, the promise to David or the Davidic covenant. In scripture, we call it that. The Lord uh, declares to you, the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood. I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men with uh, floggings. But my love will never be taken away as I took it from Saul, whom I removed. Your house, your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Now listen, what? What? Now it's one thing to say to David because it starts out by saying, hey David, your son's, you know, and if you know the story, your son's going to succeed you and he's going to build the temple. David's was passionate for God and wanted to build a temple, but his son. So the first couple lines like, yeah, 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 that's right. So my son. But then it starts going wider and bigger and deeper and farther. I don't even know what word to say because by the time you get, God's telling, telling David, you're going to have a, an eternal kingdom established forever. Like What? far beyond an earthly kingdom. Second Chronicles, we're not going to read it, but look it up for yourself. That's when God repeats the promise to Solomon and does the same thing. And what we see that the, the promises of God, they start with, I'm going to make you king, but then they quickly expand to something far greater than an earthly kingdom. And God begins to say that through David, through David, there is going to be an eternal kingdom. 
There's gonna be an eternal king that will rule forever, far beyond a human kingdom, far beyond a political nation. And when you really sit back and think about it, I've often wondered, when we get to heaven, I don't know how it all works, whether you have to make appointments with people or whatever, I don't know, reach out to them, um, you know, try to DM them or something. But if, if I do get a chance to talk to David and some of these guys, I'm going to be like, okay, listen, dude, really? When God said that, did you really understand what was going on there? Maybe so, maybe not. I don't know. But I know that looking back on it, we realize that what God was saying is that, David, I'm going to use you, an earthly king, to accomplish my purpose in the world, which far exceeds earthly kingdoms. That he's going to start with you, but it's going to far go far beyond you. And so we began to realize that there's something which far transcends David is happening in God's plan. So you see, God in history was working out his desire and his commitment, his promise to make a way for humanity, which was estranged from him, to be restored in relationship. Okay, do you hear what I just said? God, the Bible records history of God working in history to make it possible so that humanity could have a restored relationship with their creator. Now, when was, the, when was the relationship with God broken in, in humanity? Anyone? The Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, right? Because humanity were like, you know, we could probably handle this, thanks. Right? And so that relationship was broken. But God, not willing to leave humanity estranged, broken, separated from God, immediately from the garden on, began to promise and then work out through history the promise that there would be a time when humanity would be able to have a restored relationship. Why? Because God created humanity, loves humanity, loved the world so much that God was intent on doing something about it. And the exciting thing, the thing that gets me going about David, the more I thought about it, I was like, I can't get to this Sunday fast enough because I get more and more excited about David is that, that what we saw in David is that God committed to not leave humanity broken and lost in spiritual death. And so as, as history went on, God chose Abraham. Remember Abraham? And said, I'm choosing you, Abraham, and I'm going to make you a great nation. You're going to have so many descendants, it's going to be like stars of the heavens and sands of the sea. <clears throat> and that's pretty cool. I mean, hey, so he's going to be a great nation. You know, a lot of people are going to call him Father Abraham. They're going to make little camp songs about Father Abraham and stuff. But the really amazing thing about the promises that God said to Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation, and through your nation, I'm going to bring blessing back to the entire world. That was an incredible promise of God. And so then God worked through Abraham, didn't he? And then God worked through Isaac and then Jacob and through Jacob's son, one of Jacob's sons, Judah, one of the tribes. And, and so God's promise says, Abraham, now it's going to be Isaac. I'm passing on to Jacob. And of all the tr sons and tribes, I'm going to choose this tribe. And of this tribe, I'm going to choose one line, one person. And that was David. And it was at this point then when God got all the way down to this is the line where the promise of God is going to be accomplished and fulfilled. This is the way that God is going to bring salvation back to humanity so that by the time we get to Jesus, who is the Messiah, what is, he is known as the son of David. Why? Because he goes all the way back. Because God was working out his promises. He kept his promise to David, but really what he was doing was he was saying, David, you're going to be the king, and it's because of you and through you that I'm going to bring salvation, the possibility of salvation to all of humanity. You know, this is a great timing for us today in, in worship as a church community because um, after this service, after the first service, after this service, uh, we're, we're going to be celebrating believers' baptism. So I encourage you to stay for a few minutes after out here uh, so that uh, we can celebrate that. And uh, baptism is that action, that outward act. It's not a magical thing, but, but it's a fantastic, powerful 
uh, uh, I call it a word sermon, a, a word picture or sermon. And, and Paul says, those of us who are baptized, we are buried with Christ and then we are raised up to new life. Our sin, our death, our separation dies with Jesus. Symbolically, that's why baptism is so important, right? And then as the same way that Christ is raised, we are raised to new life. That's what God had in mind when he said to David that I'm gonna establish my promise, that, that I have a plan and that through you there is gonna be a Messiah. There is going to be a way. There's going to be a, a track for people. There's going to be a perfect sacrifice. There's going to be a son of David, the Messiah. And the amazing thing about David for all the things that he did, the things we learn about his leadership and all the things, the things that we learn not to do through his, I mean, all, those are all important. But as the more I thought about it, the more I was like, yes, yes. It's about the promise of God for the salvation and the opportunity for all people. You know, every uh, Sunday we take seriously as a church that the church exists to share the good news of salvation with people. Like, so today is a perfect example because the, the, uh, what it means to be a Christian, to die to our sin with Jesus, to be raised to new life, literally is, is being illustrated for us in baptism. But we want to be very clear always that the promise of God was to make it possible for every one of us to have a relationship with God through Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the Messiah. And that God is not hiding. It's not a secret plan. It's not a secret promise. It's not complicated. It's simple. Sin has separated us from God. God was not willing to leave us separated. And so God himself showed up in the Messiah, the son of David, to be a sacrifice and pay for our sin. And as we, we simply say it, that, that God is simply telling you the truth, inviting you to believe that God loves you. Jesus came, lived, died, and lives for you. And in faith, receive that for yourself. And then, remember what I said, God's ultimate solution from Ezekiel can happen because we we're born again and we can have a new heart and a new spirit. And we don't ever want to have worship and teaching or anything as a church unless, without being very clear that we exist to invite people to a relationship with Jesus Christ. When I was a young graduate student, I was pretty proud of myself because I decided, you know, as a you know, pre preparation in seminary or whatever, graduate studies, I decided that I was going to... Um, focus on Old Testament studies, right? And so my father-in-law, uh, L. Doward McBain, Mac McBain, Dr. McBain, my wife's dad, was uh, an unbelievably awesome pastor preacher. He was so good. He was an evangelist at heart, a tiny little guy, about 5'8", from uh, North Dakota, loved horses, he used to mess with me all the time. Like he figured, you know, hey, Willie, hey, I got a horse for you. So he'd bring me this horse and say, hey, I'm giving you this. You enjoy this horse. It would be a totally unbroken Arabian gelding. And then I'd get, you know, thrown off and then I wouldn't want to ride. And he's like, what? You can't handle the horse? Like, come on, man. But here's the thing. So I was a young graduate student. And I, and I, I remember saying to, to my father-in-law, I never called him Mac. I never, never could call him Mac but people called him that. I said, hey, you know, I've decided, you know, I'm going to pursue uh, Old Testament studies because so few churches and pastors really understand Hebrew and they're just not serious about the languages and it'd be so much better if preachers could, you know, translate from the original Hebrew manuscripts and they understood ancient Near Eastern history and it'd just be so much better for the church and blah, 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 blah. You know, I'm taking Hebrew and Ugaritic and Akkadian. You know, I was kind of, uh, I'm just admitting it now. He's gone, so I could admit it. If he were here, I wouldn't admit this. Feeling pretty good about myself. Like, yeah, look at me, man. I know Hebrew, right? Little did I know that a few years later as a pastor, none of you care if I know Hebrew. You don't care I spent all that time learning that stuff. But I had a really good argument for why I needed it. And, and so I, after I was done, pontificating about how it was awesome that I was going to be an Old Testament scholar and the church needed more of them. 
nor pastors, nor pastors who were Old Testament scholars. This is what he said, and I quote, Willie, read the scripture, get straight to Jesus. That's it. Joy, am I right? I'm confirming with his daughter, his favorite daughter. He's like, don't give me all that blah, 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 you know, Hebrew stuff. Just get straight to Jesus, Willie. And as I'm thinking about what we're doing here, I'm realizing he was so right. He was so correct. And David illustrates that. That that was God bringing in through time and space through a human being, David, who became the king. Because it was about getting to the Savior. It was about Jesus. And when we read passages of Scripture, we realize that the things that were said about David far exceed him. Psalm 2 was one of the examples and, and some of the others. In Psalm uh, Isaiah 9, which is one of those great passages we often read during Christmas season, by the way, so I hope we spend some time there. And, and this is what it says, of the greatness of his government. This is talking about the Messiah who is to come, the son of David, David's descendant, right? Of the greatness of his kingdom and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice, righteousness from that time and forever, the zeal of the Lord. Now, come on, that far exceeds anything that an earthly King David was about, except it's everything that the earthly King David was about because it points us to a king who is the king of kings. I love in, in uh, Luke 24, it's, it's the passage is called The Road to Emmaus. It's after Jesus was crucified and resurrected, and it tells like later that day, a couple of his disciples were walking down this, the road on the way to Emmaus. And uh, Jesus, how this happens, I don't know. I guess it's a spiritual thing. But Jesus comes along and says, hey, man, what's up? And they say, you haven't heard? You haven't heard everything that happened? They told him everything. And, and then Jesus says, the scripture says, read it for yourself. It says that Jesus said, how are you slow to believe? Did, did not the Messiah have to suffer and go on this? And then it says, beginning with Moses and the prophets. That's another word. In other words, saying, beginning with everything in the Bible, Jesus explained to them, this is what it was supposed to be to get to the Savior. Man, I would have loved to have been on that walk with Jesus. And it reminds us that we can know a lot of things but it actually is all about Jesus. I got to tell you, a few months ago, we were together, and the pastor has graciously invited me to be preach once in a while and be on the team. And so we were talking about this series going to be on David and did the dates and the topics and all, who would preach what and everything. And then it, we kind of came to the end. And we're like, okay, well, this is going to be the last one. And we want it to be a, a summary and, uh, oh, yeah, blah, 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 Willie, that's you. I'm like, oh, come on, man, really? You give me Absalom and you give me the summary of David. What are you thinking here? But I have to tell you, the more I thought about it, the more excited I got about it, the more jacked up I got about it, because I realized, although David was a great king, a politician and all that, the good, the bad, but when it really came down to it, why I became more and more excited is that David is all about the line and the history that goes to Jesus, the Messiah. The fact that David lived and God worked through David and God worked through history and made those promises is about the good news. It's about God's plan for salvation. It's about giving us the opportunity to sit here today having executed that plan through the line of David all the way to Messiah. That we would have the opportunity to have a relationship with God. That Jesus the son of David, the Messiah, is and will in fact be declared the king of kings and the Lord of lords. I was thinking about the timing of the summary and the timing where we are on the calendar. We're right, we're right on the edge. We're just about to jump into the holidays, right? Thanksgiving this week and then Advent, Christmas. And I thought, oh my goodness, what better time to be able to say, you know, you know why, you know, you know why we do all this? Because God had a plan all the way back to David that the Messiah would come 
And here we are just about to step in to that season in which above all else we proclaim that the Messiah showed up. When the angels declared and made an announcement that Jesus was born, what did they say? They're bringing you good news of a great joy which shall be for all people. God was fulfilling his promise. Is there a better time for us to be worshipers, to be, pra- to be praising God, to be proclaiming who Jesus is, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Messiah, the Savior, all of this. And as I often do, I try to do this every year. I try to take it on personally, and then I pretty much tell everybody who will listen to me, I'm, I'm encouraging you. Let me just direct you. Be on guard against getting callous and negative and an Eeyore about Christmas. It's too busy, it's too commercial, it's too this, it's too that, there's too many parties, there's too much to eat. That's ridiculous. But I want to say to you, what other time does our entire society reorient itself around the fact that the Messiah came to earth to fulfill God's plan And wouldn't that be an awesome time for God's people to proclaim the salvation in Jesus Christ? He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. The promises about his government shall never end. He shall rule over all. Those are all things about Jesus. And that's what this season is all about. So in closing, I want to invite you, us, together, to a few moments of worship. And in this worship, I want to invite you to a time of proclaiming the truth about Jesus, the son of David, the Messiah, who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And in keeping with the heart and spirit of David, who was the worship leader, to embrace in the highest possible terms the proclamation that Jesus is the Lord and salvation is through him.